Well, welcome to section three of the educational modules on the management of fractures in children. Each of these are going to be an interactive format, and the purpose is to reinforce the material, the reading material that these uh, young people have looked at and have gone through. And we use this as a method of um, reinforcing the basic principles. There, in each one of these sessions, we'll talk about a specific type of fracture pattern. The one we're going to talk about today is fractures of the distal radius and ulna. Now, we'll begin, actually, this one at the distal physis. We'll start at the distal physis. Okay, so what are the stats regarding distal radial physeal fractures? What percentage of all fractures are um, distal radial physeal fractures? When you 2%. look over all, all of them, 2%, very good, yes, 2%. What about, it's the most common physeal fracture in the child. What's the overall percentage for them? Salter here is 2, that would be 39? Yeah, pretty close, 39%, right. Now, and when do you see these fractures? When do you see these fractures? I think for women it's 9 to 10, and men it's 13 to 14. Yes. Well, for males, it's about 13 or 14, and for females, it's about 10. That's the age in which the perichondral ring begins to kind of weaken, and that's why we see most of our facial injuries in the, in the later age group. Okay, and so we're always concerned when we have an injury of in the physis. Everybody says, well, you're going to be really concerned about physis growth or rest. So since this is the most common physis, what is the incidence of growth of rest? 4%. Well, it's about 4%, right, correct, very good. So, now, if you have two fractures of the distal radius, these are the most common ones, and each of them will be a little bit different clinically. Say, this is the distal metaphysis, as we'll discuss later, is the most common fracture in children, and this is the distal physis. So what's the difference uh, in, the classific in, in this one? Well, the metaphyseal fractures have minimal carpal tunnel com collapse. What about the distal physeal fracture? Where, where do you, what, what, what do you think is the problem there? Well, that distal portion of the proximal fragment is pressing right on the carpal tunnel, and so that reason is they have more structures, more compromised. So which one do you think has the most pain in neurological dysfunction? The distal physio. The distal physio, very good, that's right. So as a result, the patients with distal physio are more acutely painful and really have more sensory changes, and that's a reason that they probably need to be reduced um, promptly. There's not one that you just put them in a splint and say you do it the next day. They probably ought to be reduced as soon as they're seen and recognized because you can get sensory changes, you can actually get an acute carpal tunnel syndrome if you leave him. Now, this is a patient that I saw years ago, and I saw this patient had a distal metaphyseal fracture. And <clears throat> I had the patient, I said, if you had any trouble, come back. Woo, they did come back in 20 minutes later. What do you think is the problem here? What was this fracture pattern? It was the growth arrest. Was yeah, it's a growth arrest, but it looks like it didn't involve the physis, it just involved the metaphysis. What kind of fracture pattern is this? Uh, the Peterson one? Yes, right. It's, this is what's happened. The fracture pattern here, now Peterson, Ham Peterson of the Mayo Clinic has his own classification. He's probably one of the biggest authorities on FISO injuries. He, in fact, he's written a whole textbook on it. And he has this, number, this type one, and what you need to understand is that this is a type one FISO pattern that can look like just a metaphyseal fracture, but the key is if the fracture lines go all the way up to the physis, then you have problems with the physeal arrest, and they need to be followed a little bit closer. This girl here required surgery to shorten the ulna because she was getting some symptoms. Now, this is a 10-year-old who fell and sustained this injury. How would you evaluate this patient? I would start with a physical exam. You do a physical exam, very good, and, and you check the neurovascular function, right? Yes. Okay, 
What's the fine cell type this person <coughs> has? That is... Well, this is a Peterson 1, right? What? Okay, so we've determined that this is a Peterson 1 type of fracture of the distal radius, and you would describe it as non-displaced, correct? Yeah. yeah. So what else are you going to do, though? Um, oh, I need to evaluate the joints above and below. That's exactly right. You need to start actually at the navicular and go all the way up to the sternoclavicular joint. And you were very good at that because what happened here? What do we have here? We have a fracture of the radial neck. Doesn't occur very often, but it, the distal radius is going to heal, but this heals in a malunited position. This patient will have some loss of function. So the message here is what? To perform a good physical exam. That's right. Always check for ipsilateral injuries. Always start at the distal portion and go proximally. Now, we classify injuries of the distal radius. How do you classify them? The Salter-Harris classification. The Salter-Harris? You think so? Well, it really doesn't help you because most, 100% of these are either Salter-Harris 1 or 2. In the many years that I've been seeing children's fractures, I've only seen one or two Salter-Harris 3 or 4 injuries. So it really doesn't tell you much as far as the treatment is concerned. What does tell you the treatment? There's another classification. That's right. We do classify them based upon the displacement patterns. And so what's this one? Dorsal. Dorsal. And do we name it? Dorsal is A. Type A, that's correct. Okay, so what's this one? Type B. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. You know your alphabet. Very good. <laughs> you learned that in grade school, I guess. <laughs> okay. Very good. So, type 1 injuries, there may be an urgency to treat the type A distal radiofacial injuries because, remember, what, what do you have there? Compression on the median nerve. Yeah. They're, they're not very comfortable. They usually have a lot of pain, a lot more pain. Their fingers are kind of numb. And so, these need to be treated very efficiently, resolved promptly. And after reduction, looks like it does pretty good and the patient feels a lot better. Yeah. Okay, so one of the f principles of treating fractures is, what's the first step? You reduce, reduce. it. reduce. Yes, that's right. So how do you reduce these? What, is this the proper technique for reducing these fractures? Uh, no, I like no. to use finger traps. Yes, right. You do this, you want to avoid this. This is what we do, and we'll describe this about distal radiometaphyseal fractures. But you avoid this maneuver, why? Uh, what do you shearing, the, concern the shearing forces. That's right, them. very good, yes, that's right. Because this one has a tendency to produce shearing forces, and it's the shearing forces that will often cause damage to the growth cells of the physis. So, what did you say the best reduction maneuver was? To use finger traps? Yes, very good, if it's fresh. And so you reduce the shear fresh with finger traps, you put them up in finger traps, what happens? Then gravity will help you get your... Yeah, reduction. often if they're fresh, you, you can just let the traction do the reduction, and it will do the reduction. And you're distracting it, and so you're decreasing the shear component of the reduction process when you do that. If it's not successful, sometimes you can give it a little pull. But the fact about traction is that you've kind of distracted it a little bit and decreased the tendency towards a shear, which can cause damage to the growth cells. So, when I was a resident, we always said you immobilize the joint above and below. Is that still true in this? Can you use a short arm cast? No, we were told never use a short arm cast. Sometimes you can use, use a short arm okay. cast. But what, is it, what do you have to do if you use a short arm cast? Make sure that you have a good mold. That's right. You got the basic principles for a short arm cast. So how does the cast have to be? It has to be an ellipse. That's right. It has to be elliptical. In other words, A over B has to be, what do we call this ratio? The cast index. The cast index. Very good. This is the cast index. And this was described by Cheese up in uh, Canada years ago. I remember when I first heard him give this talk. 
And now everybody has uh, accepted this. As long as the ideal ratio is 0.7, which means that you have an elliptical thing. And when it's elliptical, you can put more pressure on the, the uh, fragments and hold them a little bit better. So that means that you really have to, this has really become an art form when you apply a cast. You just don't wrap around plaster. You have to kind of mold it like you're going to mold a statue or a, some kind of sculpture. Now, we put the thumb in. Why do we do that? Swelling. Huh? Hmm? Swelling. Yeah. We don't put it in because it doesn't really uh, contribute to stability. You put it in for swelling. So what happens when you compress the swollen distal radius, the swollen distal form? It, all, it goes into the hand? That's exactly right. With good molding, that pushes some of the edema and is forced into the thenar area. And so that produces pressure on the edge of the cast if you have the uh, thumb not included. And so that produces this kind of reaction. At the middle of the night, they'll wake up and say, Mommy, my hand is hurting. So uh, that's the reason that we include the thumb. And then we take the thumb out when they come back in the clinic in a week. And we take the thumb out because most of the swelling has gone away by that period of time. So after you do it, you've put this elliptical cast on. How are you going to mold it? What are, where are you going to put your, your molding points? Three-point mold. So Three-point mold, yeah. Distal to the fracture site, but not through the wrist. That's right. The ca cast should be molded. You want three-point, and you want it on each of the fragments. That's right. Why do you put it dorsally mold like this? What are you using kind of to help? Uh, the intact periosteum. That's muscle. exactly right. You utilize the dorsal intact periosteum. And you flex it a little bit. Why do you do that? Uh, for the ligament. Well, we used to think so. We had the old days that, that you'd put this in what we call the cotton loader position. And it was thought that that would kind of hold the fractures, but it doesn't really. Um, it's the mold that really holds the fractures. What you do is you put it in a little bit of flexion so that when you do that, that simply facilitates your ability, takes the wrist away, and so that it allows you to put the molding process on the distal fragment. So. Here's a 14-year-old fell out of a tree. What kind of fracture does this patient have? Uh, type A. That's right, a type A complete fracture through the distal physis. And notice that this is probably a Salter Harris II fracture. But is it the Salter Harris II that determines what you're going to do, or is it the type of fracture displacement? The type of displacement. That's right, that's right. If it had been a Salter Harris I, would you treat this any different? Probably not. Yeah, so that's why it is important. So, you're a first-year resident, you just put this uh, cast on, is that pretty well reduced? Would you accept that reduction? Yes, sir. Okay, but it was a high energy and this patient had a lot of swelling. What do you think is the problem here? You're the senior resident, you come in to see the first-year resident's cast, and what do you, what's your assessment of it? There isn't a really good three-point mold on it. That's right. The cast is not okay because it's A over B is 0.8. So what do you, th what you're afraid is going to happen it's when the swelling goes down? It'll fall off. That's exactly right. It fell off. Yeah. So that's why it's important that you make sure afterwards that you've got a good elliptical cast because this cast was circular and really didn't provide good fixation, especially when the swelling goes down. So now. <clears throat> Do these remodel? Well, here's this patient three months post fracture, and actually it looks like it's beginning to remodel. And what degree of remodeling can you expect? How much? This is a 13 year old male with injury films, and <clears throat> that's a reduced fracture. Is that pretty good? Yeah, do you like that? Well, you better because that's when I did <laughs> years ago. <laughs> but it, yeah, it, is, it looks like it's a, anatomic. So I was patting myself on the back. Gee, am, am I good? It really, really looks good. But there's nothing any more humbling than long-term follow-up. And it comes back in a week, and oh my Lord, what's happened? It's displaced dorsally it, again. Yeah, it's displaced. Now, what are you going to do? 
You're going to re-manipulate or leave it alone, or you're going to operate on it? Leave what it are you going to do? Leave it alone. Leave it alone? Yeah. But doctor, it's fractured. Okay, well, here you see it at four weeks, and the clinical appearance where there is really very little prominence uh, uh, displacement here. And here you see it at three months, and it's completely remodeled. So since this is at the area when we discussed, and remember the first uh, session, since this involves the physis, there's a tremendous potential for remodeling. And so the message is here, type A fractures usually all completely remodeled as long as they're at least a year growing. And this actually was recognized back in 1935. That's just a year, I was one year old at that time, and by Dr. Aiken, and he recognized that these have tremendous remodeling, and we've known this for a long time. So, what, what are you gonna do if there's late displacement? Suppose it comes in at two weeks. You gonna leave it alone? Well, we just showed that you get good remodeling, and we had a good example in the first session. So if it's an acceptable position, what happens if you re-manipulate? What does it take to re-manipulate if it's been there for two weeks? It takes a lot of pressure, a lot of force to re-manipulate that, and because of that, you have a higher instance of growth risk. In the article by Lee, which they looked at a long, I think they had something like close to 100 distal radiophysial injuries, the ones that had growth arrest are the ones that had late manipulation. So best bet is just leave it alone. If there's any problem later on, you can either do an osteotomy or, but you want to prevent them from getting a growth arrest. So you went into orthopedics to operate, right? Yes. Okay. So what do you think might be the operative indications? Open fractures. Yeah, here's some of them. Here's a 15-year-old male, injured to his right wrist, practice, evaluated, and sent to the primary care. At the current time, denies any significant numbness or tingling. He's negative, allergies are none. He was a football player. Here's the physical findings. Swelling in the wrist with mild dinner fork deformity, tender, no defects. In this one here, what's the, what kind of fracture is this? This is an adolescent. This is a little bit different. It's kind of involving the physis, but this patient's almost, almost um, uh, skeletally mature, and so you treat this one like an adult. So what's the acceptable alignment of the anatomic perimeters? What's the acceptable alignment in the coronal plane, the angulation of the distal radial articular surface? It's about 20 degrees of inclination. All right, what about in the sagittal plane? What is that? Well, at least neutral. Yeah, you can have about 10 days, 10 degrees of volar tilt. And that was shown in some articles back in the past. So let's look at our patient here. And this patient, is that acceptable? This patient's, this patient's almost, this patient, you see the physis are closed, so this patient doesn't have a lot of remodeling capacity. Can you accept that? No, you probably want to reestablish the right angulation. Looks okay in the coronal plane, but not in the sagittal plane. So, what are you going to do? I'll reduce it. Reduce it, that's right. So you did a closed reduction in the emergency room, and it's at 90 degrees. Can you still accept that? I yeah, maybe. But you'd like to make it perfect, because this patient's good in sports. <laughs> And, or she's going to be a, a piano player or a violin player, and she really needs to have a good wrist. So you can do this with a joystick, very minimally, reduce it, and now you've got it back to the position. And then since it's got a lot of dorsal comminution, you probably ought to stabilize it with some pins. Here you can see here. This is a little bit different than one through the physis. This patient it's through the, near the physis, but there isn't any really growth left. So, here's some uh, experience of which ones you need to be aggressive about. And they say, this one article here shows that dorsal comminution is, is a bad thing that can occur. They did 4.6 of their group, required further intervention, and the factors were associated with increased risk were um, 
complete displacement of the fracture, dorsal bayonet fracture pattern, or the presence of comminution. So, the conclusion was the presence of dorsal comminution is one that you really need to be aggressive and watch because they have a significant hire of displacement supplemental. And so some of those you probably ought to be a little bit more aggressive and those some of those that you might want to do K-wiring. That's especially true like that one we just saw, the one that was getting close to skeletal maturity. That's why we put those pins in. Now, there's a little bit of controversy of whether if you have distal radial physeal injuries, that the physis is still open. Can you treat it with a cast or should you pin them all? And the people in Boston seem to think that you ought to pin them. That's their experience. And they had a subgroup with complete metaphyseal fractures and they um, compared the results of closed reduction and cast immobilization versus pin fixation. They had the results of cast reduction and cast versus percutaneous pin fixation. Which do you think works better? What's the advantages and disadvantages of both? Well, I think a lot of it depends on how good you are putting the cast on. If you're going to put the cast on, we have very little problems with it. But if you don't put a good cast on and you just kind of put a circular cast, there's probably a higher instance. Now, what they found was they had 34 patients in the study and they were randomized. Some did cast, some did percutaneous pinning, as you can see here. And they, they found that 39% of the patients with casting had loss of reduction with the casting. And when they came back with those that were treated with pin fixation, they had almost were treated with pin fixation and all resolved following pin removal without long-term sequelae. And the most important thing is, does it cost more to put the pins in? And they said their cost analysis showed no significant difference in treatment changes between the groups. So I think it makes a determination which would you feel the most comfortable. Certainly if you have a lot of swelling or you have an obese child that you can't, you're concerned that when the swelling goes down your cast may not be good or you've got some comminution, then you probably ought to consider pins. But they each one ought to be done based upon your ability to put on a kid cast and what type of patient you have and what type of fracture pattern. Now, if the lateral fractures, you have distal radiophysis and you have you want to stabilize that first before you do the, the supraconner fracture, and you don't want to put on a real tight cast if you've got a supraconger fracture because you want to be able to watch them and make sure you're not increasing their instance of growth arrest. So if you put a pin through the physis itself, there are some rare cases in which even if it's a smooth pin will cause a growth arrest. So what, how are you going to manage this one? You place the pin obliquely so that what you can do, you can avoid the physis. And how does this, how do these mostly displace? Dorsally. If it's, an, if it's a type A fracture, they'll displace dorsally. And if you put the pin obliquely, how does it work? Yeah, it works kind of like a dorsal buttress and just prevents it from, and holds it. And you do this without having to go through the physis. Now, what type is this? That is a type Of course you B. can read, yeah. It's a type B. <laughs> Very All good. So, how does this differ? Um, it's harder to maintain the reduction. That's right. And what about getting your reduction? You do it the same way? Quite. No, you don't. The reduction forces are reversed. You go in the opposite direction because you have to bring that fragment up. So, and again, you do your post-reduction positioning. So, you, the periosteum is volar is, is intact. Where are you going to put your, your pressure points? On the distal fragment again, but on the volar side. Yeah, okay. So the wrist is dorsiflexed as well. Suppose like you can do that. Can you put the pressure point directly on the fragment? In the dorsal ones, you can, type A. Can you do that here? Not very well. Why? Here's the type B. Did a closed reduction. 
looks pretty good. Pressure points. But where is that distal pressure point? Is it on the distal fragment? No. No, why? Because its wrist is dorsiflexed. Looks simple, but they have reduction in alignment. And so the problem with type B fractures, type A, you can put the fracture molding right over the distal fragment. And it's relatively easy to hold the position with a cast. But if it's if it's a, a, a volar displaced, you've got neurovascular tissue, so you can't put the pressure right over it. And you usually end up, where's the pressure in on? It was not on the distal fragment. It usually ends up on the hamate and the pisiform is where the fracture is. So you don't have a good ability to really hold it. So here's this post-reduction. Came back in a week and it had fallen off. And who was it? You said that they were unstable. You said they were unstable. And so a lot of these, the fracture, this fracture was re-manipulated and stabilized with a percutaneous pin. So the message here is that the type B patterns are intrinsically unstable and difficult to control with the cast. Fortunately, in my experience, there are only about five, maybe at the most 10%. It's very rare to see the type B fracture. So if you have a type B, then you probably ought to have a lower threshold for putting pins in there. And again, you try to avoid putting it in the physis and putting it in so that you'll hold it, a pin fixation following reduction. There's another technique, if it's really kind of comminuted, you can put a volar plate on it, and you don't put any screws on there, you just use it as a buttress, and it can be used if it's an unstable type B, or it's got a lot of comminution, you can, like this one, this one was kind of unstable, and it was going to be difficult to stabilize, and so they put a, a plate on it, just a volar plate, but they didn't put screws in the distal fragment, and held it there until it healed, and then you can take the plate off later on. And that way you don't have to worry about putting screws across the physis and causing growth arrest, inhibiting growth. And this went on to heal. The screws across the physis. All right, so here's a 13-year-old male injury films, and what kind of fracture pattern? Type B. B, yeah, right. Now, <clears throat> what about the remodeling capacity of a type B? Well, let's look at this patient. Here's a patient that was three weeks post-fracture, was treated elsewhere, and was treated in a fracture. What's, what's your assessment of this? You're a senior resident that was done by the first year resident, shows up in the clinic. What's your assessment here? The alignment is not acceptable. And why? It has volar angulation. Yeah, but why? why, why I know it's not acceptable, but oh, why do you think? He's near the end of his growth. Well, one was, what's the cast quality? It has a high cast index. That's one thing, and he wasn't dorsiflexed. And you really can't hold him very well. And the other thing is that he used fiberglass. Now, there's a controversy. Some people use only fiberglass, but it's my opinion that you, on things, if you want something to really mold that you need to put plaster, then you can cover it with fiberglass. So, he comes back at six weeks, What's it look like? Not very good, is he? Yeah, he's, he's stuck down in pronation and that ulna is sticking up there and he's got that prominence in the ulna and it's stuck in pronation and he's also stuck in a little bit of radial deviation and so it looks kind of ugly and he's also lost motion so that's the clinical appearance and, there's, and then unfortunately there's very little soft tissue to hide the bony angulation. If it was dorsally displaced, you have a lot of soft tissue that will hide some of the angulation. But if it's volarly displaced, you don't have anything to hide it. And so the clinical appearance was very unacceptable. And he was fixed in pronation with a prominent ulnar styloid. And the mother was very unhappy, so she filed a suit. So it takes two years before the suit gets to court in many places like this. What's happened? It's remodeled. It's remodeled, yes, very much so. The remodeling was complete, and so the mother didn't have a suit, and her lawyer told her better drop it. But well, the, what's the message here? Well, the radial remodeling is probably about the same as type A fractures, but during this period of remodeling, you have an unacceptable appearance. <laughs>
and it's slow to disappear. Whereas in the elements, you don't see the angulation if it's dorsally displaced. Post-fracture care, what is your concern post-fracture? What do you tell the parents when you do these? There's a fracture through the growth plate. It may develop a growth arrest. Okay, so what do you have to do? Follow them. That's exactly right. Here's a seven-year-old. Are you worried about this one? That's not very displaced. Yes. You're worried? Yeah. Well, do you need to follow it? Because that, that to me, it looks like it's very much displaced. Would you follow it? Yes. Very good. Because he healed uneventfully. He had a full range of motion and strength. And do all he need to become? Well, he came back two and a half years later and had a growth arrest. So your treatment here is going to be a little bit different because you've now got distal radial ulnar dissociation. You've got a shortened radius. And maybe if you'd seen it early, you may have been able to reverse that growth arrest. And you got a bony bridge. And so the answer is like you say, yes, you need to follow them. So what do you look for following the injuries? Here you got this one, you reduced it, and it looks good. What do you look for? How do you know that it's going to grow, that it's growing? What do you look for? An open physis. An open physis, what else? The yeah, that's right. Whenever you have an injury, you have a slowdown of growth. And when we talked about this in the first section, and they call that the Harris Park growth arrest lines. And if you have symmetrical migration, you know that it's still growing. That's the best sign that you want. Once you see that, then you probably can, may not need to have them come back. You demonstrate that it is growing, and it's growing symmetrically. Now, what about an open reduction? What's, what would you think would be the primary reason for a closed fracture, but an open reduction? Concern in our that's right. It's, that's very good. Here's a good example. This patient here, they had had the best reduction. They had tried twice uh, to do this, and this patient still had numbness in the hand and had median nerve symptoms. You going to leave this alone? Let it remodel? No. no. So the surgical approach, you're going to go dorsal or palmar? Uh, probably volar. Pa yeah, probably volar. So a volar approach was chosen, and so as you can see, the median nerve was pressed right against that distal fragment. And so that's important. It's one of the few reasons that you need to do an open reduction surgical intervention. Now, what about the distal ulna? We have, we've always been focused on the distal radius, but do we need to look at the distal ulna? What are the most common injuries? You usually have an injury to the distal radius and ulna, and we talked about the radius is usually a metaphyseal or physeal. What are the common injuries that are usually associated in the ulna? Uh, starlight fracture. A what? The ulnar That's right. Usually it's the ulnar styloid is taken off. And by and large, there's not much written about it, but there doesn't seem to be any problem with this fracture here, at least in children, maybe in adults, but not in children. What's the other type of fracture that you see? A transficeal. Well, yeah, that's pretty rare. What you see here is usually you just see metaphyseal fractures that are occurring. Those are the two usually you, that you see. Now, this patient fell out of a tree, and you call me from the emergency room, and you, what do you, how are you going to describe this patient's fractures? You got arrows there, so you pointed. <laughs> the yeah. error won't be on the x-ray, I can assure you. Go ahead. A fracture of the distal radius. What kind? Type A. Well, no, it's actually, is it metaphyseal or physeal? Metaphyseal. Metaphyseal. What's the other injury? And uh, metaphyseal distal ulna fracture. Well, maybe a little bit farther distal. The distal radius is a bayonet apposition dorsal. And, and in this one here, the distal ulna, though, is probably a type 1 physeal injury, which is very rare. Does that bother you? Well, this Salter here is type physeal injuries. Now, <clears throat> this patient was treated elsewhere, and we had a, and this was, was a good orthopedic surgeon, and got a good, re would you accept that reduction? Yes. It's offset a little bit, I think he's seven years old. 
and it's all said a little bit, you'd accept them. But what else do you need to do now? Put a good cast on. Yeah, I know, put it in a cast, but then after it's healed, what do you need to do? Oh, follow it. Mm-hmm. You need to follow it. Why? To see if there's any growth or rest. Of the Where? Of oh, the distal ulna. Very good. Yeah, you see this. This one mm-hmm. was sent to me because the ulna had, had mm-hmm. arrested. And in three years had a complete arrest of the distal ulna with a shortening. And it's developed a kind of a mad lynx deformity. And the, the reason is, if you look at, fortunately, the, the instance of growth arrest, and we're not really sure why, for distal physeal fractures is about 50%. So, but fortunately, they're pretty rare to have distal, distal, distal physis injury. So, what is the most common fracture that occurs in the pediatric age group? You, you've been in the emergency room. What's the most common fracture you see down there? The distal radius. Yes. What type? Metaphysis. Most of them are metaphyseal fractures. And when do you see those? Uh, similar ages. Yeah, a little bit. Well, actually, it's a little bit later. It's during the period of rapid growth, which occurs, to be more specific, in males, it's about 13 to 14. Females, they mature a little bit earlier. Now, how do you classify distal metaphyseal fractures? What's, what's the most useful in determining the treatment? The direction of displacement? Well, it's pretty the degree of the biomechanical failure. Mm-hmm. So what are the three types of, what are the three stages of biomechanical failure? Uh, three degrees. Taurus, what's the next one? You know, we talked about this in the first section. It would be tension. Yeah, it'd be a green, green stick. stick. Yeah. So there's a green stick, and finally, if you've got enough force, you'll have complete. So what kind of fracture do you have here? That looks like a complete. Yeah, but it's still it maybe got a little bit of dorsal cortex. Green stick. That's a green stick, disease. yeah. But you need to be a little bit more specific about the green stick. What type of green stick is it? You need to know what the direction of the apex is. So there are two types of apex floor green stick fractures. This is a uh, <clears throat> tension type here, and what in this one here is actually just, you just failed in compression, but it hasn't failed in tension. So does it make a difference? Yes. In what respect? Tension tends to have a higher risk of... That's right. Yeah, you know, it depends on the integrity of the periosteum. And the tension, probably the periosteum is ruptured, whereas on the compression, the cortex is intact. So these are unstable, and these are stable. Now, what stage of fracture pattern do we have here? Complete. Complete, that's right. It's a complete distal metaphyseal fracture. So there are two subgroups of complete. What are they? Well, this one, the length has been maintained. What's happened here? Bayonet. Yeah, this is bayonet apposition. The length has been lost. So, in bayonet fractures, there are two types. What type are they? What does it depend on? Well, it depends on what kind of soldier you have. <laughs> yeah. So, what kind is this one? Well, this one be either dorsal bayonet or volar bayonet. And I think I looked at soldiers with bayonets, and most of them are volar bayonet. I think it's because if you put it on the dorsum, you can't see the sight when you're shooting at a long distance. So, now we'll go back to green stick fractures. What about the compression green stick? This is actually just a, a little bit past the stage of a torus fracture, and what kind of a mobilization do you need? Well, they're pretty stable, and so just about anything you put on them is sufficient. You might even be able to get by with just a, a Velcro splint or certainly a simple cast, and they usually don't have late, much in the way of late displacement. What about this one, though? Well, this one, the major problem with this pattern is they have lost that periosteum, and when the swelling goes down, they have a predisposition to late angulation, so they're kind of unstable. And so they need to be followed closely. 
Here's this patient four weeks later. What are you going to do? Well, this we'll go ahead and remodel it. We'll discuss that later. But what you need to do if you've got a tension green stick fracture, you tell the parents that there's a possibility that this may have a little bit of angulation when it comes back later, but it usually was in with the limits of remodeling. But when you have a tension green stick fracture, you really need to be a little bit more careful to make sure you have a very well molded cast. Now, what's the problem if it's an apex dorsal fracture? The, what they, they look pretty benign on x-ray. What does it look like clinically? They look a lot worse. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have any soft tissue to hide that. Um, so, like this one, there's a lot of soft tissue volar to hide the angulation. But when you go in this one, there's not much soft tissue. And so you've got your angulation is a little bit more apparent cosmetically. They will go ahead and remodel, but there's more deformity per degree of angulation. And there's another risk factor, factor with this. What is it? Well, this is pretty solid to heal. Can you go back to playing football? Not yet. Not yet. Why? Because if it's got this residual angulation, this has been my experience, they're predisposed, that tension is predisposed to fracture. And so I've had some of these refracture here. So I hold these uh, from uh, strenuous activity for a little bit longer. And they because it seems to be that the, the message here with apex dorsal green stick fractures you need to be more aggressive in reducing the fracture pattern and in putting on a good cast. Now, let's look at the typical distal bayonet, dorsal bayonet. If it's complete length maintained, what do you have to correct? Angulation. Simply correct the angulation until it's anatomical alignment, right? Suppose it's dorsal bayonet, what, what do you have to do? Can you, so you have to do two steps. What's the first step? Traction. Yeah, the first step is that you have to reestablish the length. Then what do you have to do? I you correct the alignment. Yeah. So if you're going to do this, the appropriate manipulation technique, it's shortened. All, all you got to do is put longitudinal traction. What does that accomplish? Does that reduce it? Like no. Like no. So what's accomplished with that? Nothing more than just compressing the, the, the fragments. So to reestablish the length, what do you have to do? Recreate the deformity. That's exactly right. You have to hyperextend that distal fragment, and that may require someone to give you a little bit of counter traction. And you have to put your thumb right over that distal fragment, and you have to kind of walk it off the proximal fragment, and you have to f first reestablish the length and then once you got to reestablish the length, you have part A and part B. So then once you've reestablished the length, then you flex it. And once you flex it, then you've reestablished A next to B. So this is one you see in the emergency room. Does this fracture pattern have any concern to you? Like what? Well, it's bayonet. Also, um, well, there's two things that make this fracture going to be difficult. One, the ulna is intact, so you, you, it's difficult to manipulate. What's the other factor? Swollen. Well, what is this happening here? You've got, what do you call this? You've really kind of got the reverse angulation, the long sides are opposite each other. So it's a long ways to get A over to B. So this one may be a little bit of a problem in getting a reduction. So it may be difficult to get A down to B. Now, this is a patient fell out of the tree, sustained this injury. What type of fracture is it? Uh, metaphyseal. Metaphyseal, what else? Dorsal, probably gonna end up being dorsal bayonet, right? So. First year resident doesn't attempt it. And he doesn't do very good. So the second year or the senior resident comes in, tries to rescue him, and he doesn't do it. 
So the staff man comes in and said, you just don't know how to do it, the being at your position, and this is the best that you can get after the staff man has done this. So now what are we going to do? I got ill. Huh? You got dorsal bayonet. What are we going to do? Go to the OR. Go to the OR? Why? Yeah. Okay. What are the alternatives? You can go to the OR. Then you're going to put a scar on this patient. Well, you leave it alone because it's going to remodel. Here's this patient at 18 months, and here's this patient at five years. And <clears throat> the big thing is you don't put them in full pronation. So. In fact, there are some centers now that are not even attempting to reduce these dorsal bayonet. This is a good study out of uh, Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. And what they did, they had no analgesia, no sedation. They just put a short arm fiberglass cast gently molded to correct any angulation. And they accepted up to 15 degrees of angulation. And they found that their residual angulation at the time of follow-up was only two degrees, or eight, eight degrees respectively, and they all achieved clinically and radiographic union with a full range of wrist motion, and the parents and guardians were, answering them, were quite satisfied with this treatment. And this is the real thing. It was the close reduction with the patient under conscious sedation or general anesthesia is about five to six times more expensive than the treatment used in this study. It's a little bit difficult, though, to convince the parents not to do anything. But after you've tried for a couple of times and you don't, you can do this. So there may be more people that are just accepting this as long as there's two years of growth left. Okay. Is there a, you got here, and is there a percutaneous way that you can reduce this irreducible fracture by manipulation alone? What can you do? You can get the KYR as a joystick. Joystick, that's right. You can lever the fragment percutaneously. Very good. You can put the patient, in, this does require general anesthesia. You can put them to sleep, and then you can reduce it, and that way you can do this with just a little percutaneous. A, a, a pin track. Here's a good example of one that was this way, and we went ahead and reduced it, <clears throat> and here it is right now. It's fully reduced. Went on to heal. Post reduction immobilization for metastasis fractures. Do you need a long arm cast or a short arm cast? Short arm cast. Yeah, you, it's the same principles for distal fissile fractures applied to metastasis fractures as long as you put on a good cast with a good cast index. All right, suppose the patient comes in. Here's a technique that can be useful. 11-year-old male presented in the clinic, seen initially in an outside hospital, told to make an appointment because the orthopedists at that hospital do not treat patients of that age. It took two weeks to get an appointment at the clinic in San Antonio. And <clears throat> what do you see there? This patient is 13 years old, and he's going to be good in sports. <laughs> yeah, so he's got 30 degrees of angulation, and he's also got radial deviation. So, it doesn't look very good either, does it? Mother's really kind of concerned about the clinical appearance. So, is this acceptable for this 11-year-old male? So, this patient then thought we need using clinic using Armstrong anesthesia no, under ER under conscious sedation. Probably ought to do it in the OR under general anesthesia. And that was chosen and we got a good reduction because it's going to be really hard. This patient already has callus and it's going to be a little bit difficult to manipulate this one. So is that acceptable alignment? Yes. Yeah. If you've had to do it a second time, first time, can you depend on the cast alone? No. Maybe you shouldn't. You've already got them asleep, so probably other considerations. And so cross pins were used. What's the problem here? Uh, risk of an infection? Well, the, yeah, it's an infection. That's down the road, but initially. Yeah, well, it, it's a little bit more proximal, so it's hard to get good cross pins across it. 
and probably retrograde pins may have been a little bit better. So, you, you, you put them in a splint, you put them in a cast, a short arm, a long arm cast, or nothing. Well, long arm cast was done. Uh-oh, you took a picture. This is image intensifier in the emergency. Well, it's still, the patient's still asleep. What's happened? You've lost your, it's gone back to the link. The main reason is because cross pins were probably not the appropriate treatment because they crossed right at the fracture site and weren't very stable. So now what are you going to do? The original angulation has recurred, and so what the next thing is, you're going to reduce cross pins with IM pins, you're going to manipulate the cast and apply a new cast, or what other thing can you do? Wedge a cast. cast. You know, that's kind of a lost art. So the cast, wedging the cast was chosen. Here's the initial saw cut, and you leave a volar hinge, and we opened at 30 degrees, the amount of angulation needed to correct the deformity. And here we are, we've got it corrected. And alignment's now acceptable. In one week, it's, it's held up. And when we took the cast off, it's held up. But notice again, the, the pins cross at the fracture site. So this was still a little bit unstable. The thing is, it is valuable to have the skills of wedging a cast. Unfortunately, that's kind of a lost art. We don't really do that very much uh, in managing fractures non-operatively. All right, what's this fracture pattern? Um, let's say a boulder? Yeah, right. That's a volar fracture. Volar bayonet. Okay. Different army. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so how is it different from a dorsal bayonet? Um, well, here again. Appearance. Yeah, the, the, the reduction mechanism is reversed. What's the other problem? Where's that, where are you putting your pressure on that distal fragment? You're really putting it on the tendons and everything. It's really difficult to do it. So you, it's really hard to put pressure here. And so when you mold it, you mold it in the opposite direction. Three-point molding is reversed. And so this may be difficult to maintain due to the volar tissues. And so, <clears throat> uh, those I have a tendency to uh, stabilize with a pin. So, uh, the operative indications, because you like to operate, right? Okay. If it's a, <clears throat> this one was a late reduction, and certainly if it's a late reduction, you better pin it. Uh, because I've done reductions, because it said it was on, <coughs> acceptable, and then when they come back in a week, it's right back where it was. And so it's kind of hard to tell them that we've got to redo it again. So the simplest thing is, this is one that you probably just put a percutaneous pin. Now, what do we see here? Oh, we'll get a closer look at this. What do you see? Distal radius pressure with the ulnar uh, DRJ injury. Yeah, right. So that's called a Galeazzi fracture. You don't speak Italian, no. So, what are the two components? Uh, Distorius and then a, uh, What kind? Metaphyseal. In the child? Uh, metaphyseal. Yeah, metaphyseal. And it's a, usually they're green stick in children. And we'll discuss the importance of that. And so what's happened here? You got distal radial ulnar dissociation. So, how do they differ in the skeletal and mature? Have you seen Galeazzi fractures in the adults? Yeah. And where you usually have to operate on all those. Yeah. Well, the distal often is a green stick fracture, and so you can do a closed reduction. Or it may, in the distal radial ulnar joint, it may go through the physis rather than through the ligament. So you can, like in this one. Now, <clears throat> you can see that the ligament's off, the physis is off. This is a type 1 physal injury. But the key is, there is a bowler uh, fracture, and what's the other one? That's bowler, what's this one? Uh, apex dorsal. Apex dorsal, that's right. You can see here. And that's Walsh's classification. And so, how do you manage these? If it's this one, how do you manage it? You would reduce it and cast it in supination. Yeah, this is one that you put it in a uh, long arm cast with the forearm pronated. It's in supination, so you put it in pronation. But this one, since you've got, you need to control rotation, you do need to put it in a long arm cast. 
per rotation. This one, how are you going to put it? Well, it's reverse angulation, so you put it in long arm cast with the forearm supinated. But that's only if the green stick fracture, radial fracture, because with a green stick radial fracture, what is it? It is usually length stable. So the intaxorum maintains the length. So here's instability of the distal ulnar physis. How are you going to manage this one? Well, you get a closed reduction, you can percutaneous pin fixation, but remember the radius has green stick, so that's the length stable. And is this one reduced? How do you assess the quality? Well, the, uh, the radial uh, length, the radial length has been reestablished in relationship to the ulna. That's very important. Now, most of these, <clears throat> if they're length unstable, they'll require operative stabilization. Here's another example. This one has complete fracture of the distal metaphysis, and it's going to be unstable. <clears throat> so, you got, and you, especially if you have this, type 1 fracture. So the problem here, if the radial fracture is complete, it too is length unstable. So then you have to do something to stabilize the radius. And in this one, it was easy to stabilize it with cross pins. Uh, I think I might have used uh, intermediary pins, but distal radius were reduced and stabilized. Now, if it's complete with shortening, is this one, the distal radius, this one was not recognized as a Galeazzi. What is it about this fracture that tells you it's a Galeazzi component? The plastic deformation of the distal ulna. The what? Plastic deformation of the distal ulna. Well, actually, it's a distal green stick fracture, but what is the key? Well, the radius has been shortened, so that tells you that there's some dissociation associated with it. So everybody just, this doctor just focused on the radius, and he thought, see, it's, it's shortened. So the radius is shortened, and he just put it in a cast. Is that acceptable? Well, it's probably inadequate. So he tried pin fixation. Is that going to hold it? No. Stable? No, it's not going to hold it very well. So alternatives, what about intermediary pins? Well, they don't really provide much in the way of length stability. So what is the base stabilization? Yeah, right, exactly right. A plate is, this is one place where you need to do an open reduction and a plate fixation. And have we gotten a good reduction? How do you assess it? Yeah, because we established the re, reestablished the radial link. Very good. Okay, well, thank you very much for your participation. And I hope that this has helped you reinforce what you read and reinforce the basic principles in treating fractures of the distal radius. Thank you.